Ted Rath, welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Rob, my honor, man. I appreciate it. Really appreciate the invite. My pleasure. So you've been on a round table before. I think we're discussing deceleration with um, a couple of the guys. So it's a pleasure to make it podcast official and get you on the get on the, uh, the this podcast. So anyone that doesn't know who you are, Ted, would you mind giving us a rundown on previous experience and what you're doing now? Yeah, absolutely. Ted Rath, uh, Vice President of Player Performance for the Philadelphia Eagles. I've been in the NFL. This is my 16th season. Uh, prior to this, I was Director of Strength Training and Performance for the Los Angeles Rams. Prior to that, Miami Dolphins, assistant strength and conditioning coach. Prior to that, Detroit Lions, same role, assistant strength and conditioning coach. Started out my career in college at the university level. I played football, collegiate football, American football, and at the University of Toledo, which is a Division I school, a mid-major here down in Ohio. Uh, finished playing, actually went in as a graduate assistant there, worked on my postgraduate degree, then got promoted after one year into a full-time position where I oversaw all the Olympic sports and then helped, obviously, assisted with the football training and conditioning, and then was fortunate to get in the NFL. I've had a couple spurts where I've worked at the high school level too, which I think is always fun. I love pointing that out because as a coach, as a practitioner, how better do you learn to cue and to get into the details of coaching by training young athletes and those up and coming? I know this, it's helped me and it's developed me into becoming a better coach and practitioner at this point in my career, just working with those youth athletes as well. Great shout, great shout. And what do you say, 16 years? Yep, 16 in the NFL. Doing something right. You're doing something right. right. I'm guessing there's not many people who last that long. <laughs> not not for long league, but yeah, not long. Nice. I've worked with a lot of people and got lucky to be in some good situations. Good man. I think you're absolutely right with the high school thing. I mean, you'll I'm sure you'll get <clears throat> you'll get people messaging you. How can I get to your position at wherever you've been along the journey? But I think something that gets missed is hold on a second. Like you can learn so much doing work at the high school level or, you know, over here at an amateur club or whatever it is. Because if you mess up there, like, it's not great, but you can do. When you mess up at your level, there's big implications. So I think that's definitely a, yeah, good work echoing that. Definitely. No question. Yeah, you learn. We all learn. You got to take reps. It's the only way that we learn. Of course, of course. So the first thing I want to discuss, I think this will give us a nice little jumping off point. I think it's a, when I ask it, I often think, oh, do people want to answer this? I know it's a difficult one to kind of put into words, but it's a philosophy. Like what is your philosophy when it comes to player development, strength and conditioning, whatever you want to call it? Yeah, great question. I love it. The first thing that I always say, I start with this word, power, because for me, American football is the ultimate power sport where we deal with so many intricacies within obviously bioenergetics and all the energy systems that we have to develop for the sport itself. But from a muscular system, we have to have an engine, we have to have muscular performance, which ultimately is going to equal power. We need to have powerful athletes that can move as fast as possible and be efficient and functional in those movement strategies. So for us, it's movement efficiency. And ultimately for us, it's power. But then the other side of this, we have to develop body armor. So we have to develop a protective sheath and a protective carnal really casing for our guys so that they can protect themselves because obviously it's a violence and collision sport so for us there's those multiple factors where we have to make sure that we're training for the function we're training for the body armor and then we're developing movement patterns and efficiencies around all these things so for me it starts with power we have to develop power with that strength is a prerequisite so linear periodization model is what we typically function off of we build that through our macro and our micro cycles from the football calendar so for us we look at everything in a 12-month picture after we look at that 12-month zoom out view, I zoom back in. Now, what time of the year are we in? Right now, it's uh, February 21st. We're in our what we call our early off-season acclimation period, so a lot of general prep. We're going off of we our season ended approximately a month ago after the postseason. So for us, as we go into this phase, we're trying to get back to joints, connective tissue, and then muscular tissue. We want to reset the body system so that our athletes are able, when we start our off-season training here in about five, six weeks and ramp it up, our, our, developed cell, our skeletal system is developed to a point where they're ready to go into some high force dynamic movements. We can add load, and then eventually we're going to get back into full functioning football. So by the time we hit May this, this year, we'll be in, on the football field. We'll have approximately 90 athletes out there, and we're going through full functional football practice. So getting the athletes back from a health perspective and then building them in linear periodization-wise 
to develop a system where we can go back into full function of football. And then basically we start the calendar over once we hit summer and then we come back for training camp. So everything's built on that macro micro cycle. We try to, we utilize linear periodization for most of that. And then within that, for me, it always comes back to power route. We have to develop powerful athletes if we expect to not just compete, but hopefully win world championships at this level. So this next couple of weeks, can you give us any detail about what this actually looks like from a day-to-day, week-to-week perspective? Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. No, I love it. And for us, we could go really in-depth. Like there, there's parts that we pull from the triphasic system. There's parts that we pull in here because for me, getting back to the connective tissue and building the skeletal system so that it's ready to take on both my 34-year-old athlete who has been in the NFL for going on 11 years and then my fresh out of college 21-year-old, they're both ready to to stack into the next phase. For us, that's going to be spring football. So for me, looking at that static exercises, especially for our older athletes that have a longer training and training age, but also playing history, looking at eccentric work at this time of year so that once again, we can build in stability patterns before we start to go into the high dynamic, very functional movements, and then building into that movement pattern. So if we're if we're looking at acceleration mechanics, it's starting them in a static position and with some of our wall drill progressions. And then it's going back into our plyometric progressions where we regress all the way back to non-counter movements, bilateral jumps, teaching our athletes how to load and receive force appropriately. Because if we can't decelerate our own body mass, then something's going to break once I put you in a high-speed environment going against another 300-pounder who's ultimately trying to beat you as well. So when you say static, we're talking isometrics? Yep. Okay, perfect. Let's have a little let's have a little dive into that, and then we'll we'll have a little um, chat around eccentrics. So talk to us a little bit about the first coming in after having a little bit of time off. Is isometrics the first place you start? If not, what is the what is that first place? Yep. Traditionally, we will start with ISO patterns. So for me, and once again, I'll, I'll use let's use like a ten year NFL vet. So this is a player who's played for ten years. And just at the NFL level, you lump on four years of university plus four years of of high school. They've been playing the sport of football for almost 20 years, sometimes longer. So a lot of training history, a lot of training age. We obviously look at injury history, what we have to modify around the athlete. But pretending that this is a generally healthy athlete, we're going to start with we're going to start with a lot of ISO. So for us, lower body training wise, day one, week one, where we give them two to four weeks off and they're starting to ramp back, back into training. We start with a general prep phase. We want to make sure the tissue is adequately prepared for us. That starts with a lot of the tissue prep. So if I haven't touched a weight, if they haven't touched anything close to exercise in about four weeks, we need to fundamentally start with some movement patterns. So we're getting them back into movement. We're getting them back into actually exhibiting very low frequency, very low intensity movement patterns before we even go into the quote unquote weight room. For me, as we develop into that, then I'm going to start to touch into, okay, let's put them into static positions. Let's hold. Let's make sure we're still focusing on mobility and things like that. We're hoping that they've done that over that two to four week period while they're recovering. But then as we build static exercises, isometric exercises, we're going to incorporate some eccentrics even within that first week. I'm not, I'm not going to go crazy from a loading perspective, Rob. We're probably going to err on the side of very, very light loading. So if I'm introducing an isometric exercise, day one, week one, or even an eccentric based exercise, it's going to be 50% of a one rep maximum for that time. But I'm going to increase time under tension. I'm going to go time under load. I'm going to really slow down some of our eccentric patterning. I might go lower repetitions, but higher time under tension. So for me, once again, as the older athletes are like that, not that it's very, it's not completely different for a younger athlete. We still need to get them back from a joint perspective where they're healthy enough to start to add the progressive overload as we progress through this, this program. So would it, so this 10 year athlete that's been around, been around the organization for three years, for example, every year, would you cycle back through the same process? Traditionally? Yes. And then the unique variable is our guys, no off season is, is alike. If you rewound after a 2022 season, going to, we played for an additional month. We basically played for seven months. We had to basically speed up and expedite that entire process. By the time we got back, we as a coaching staff had a week to prepare before we had to go to the combine and start our draft process. So it shrunk that time that we typically get to spend with the players from a month. We lost that month because we were still playing competitive football. So we had to expedite that next phase. So we cut down some of the systems. We cut down some of the, t- the training times of our isometrics, of our eccentric loading, and expedited that in because we still started at the same time. By the time we hit mid-April, we were we were basically in our off-season training program. So no two years look alike. And then if you're an individual player, 
this player might have had significantly more playing time just based on outside factors. Maybe they were a backup role and they were transitioning into a starter role or from a special teams player who took on significant offensive duties or whatever the situation is. No two years look alike. So within that, the general plan will remain the same, Rob. But then obviously we have to maintain the ability to adapt. Our greatest tool as coaches is adaptability. So you have to be able to look at the context. Once again, I'll zoom out. You zoom back into the actual context of what that athlete has went through, and then we look at it from an individualized standpoint. What do they need before we start to progress into what our off-season training will become? So with the eccentrics in this phase of the the year, how are you you using eccentrics? Is it manually um, resisted? Is it flywheel? What what is it? We'll do a combination of everything. We definitely believe in flywheel training. We love it. For us this time, we do incorporate some manual resistance exercises, but for, we're still using external loads. How we control the tempo is really probably more of an indicator of what we're doing. So as we progress into that, once again, the time under load is going to change weekly. So if we look at this from a linear standpoint, maybe week one, we start under, it could be a traditional barbell back squat or front squat pattern. We're going to change their time under load. So the eccentric pattern could begin in that week one with a five second eccentric tempo and then a two to three second concentric phase. We're still going to time everything else. So for me, it's controlling and then manipulating that as we start to progress the load over time. Once again, lighter load up front. We're still trying to allow the joints and the connective tissue and everything to respond adequately before we start to stress the muscular system and really high frequency, high dynamic movements, high velocity movements. So for us, the time under tension is really applicable where we're looking at not just isometrics and how long we're holding a certain position, but as we transition into the beginning phase of some of those eccentrics, we're going to manipulate that time under tension as we start to do that. How specific do you, maybe it's not in this phase and maybe we develop that into the, into the next phase and the, the phase after that, but how specific do you get with angles and isometrics based on the demands of the, of the different positions that you are dealing with? Great. I love that question. Really for us, we'll start as a general foundational principle. It's movement mechanics. So our angles are all going to matter for us. It's more of an accelerative versus top end speed versus lateral cutting versus some of the crossover mechanics that we'll teach, those angles were very detailed with, and we're getting hands-on with that, especially when we're in that static and that isometric phase, Rob, because I can put an athlete on a wall, I can show them a clip, I can video them or take a photo, a still frame, and show them the exact angle they're at, or I can use a Dari system, or I can use Qualysis, I can use high-speed cap motion capture to show the athletes where they are and then say, hey, here's where you are, you're at a 47% angle, here's where we want to get you, and actually put a number on that but still use that visual cue where most of us are visual learners, definitely most of our athletes. So for me, using that technology and being able to show them even from an iPhone, a capture or a video of where we want them, that's huge. From a positional standpoint, I would say the next phase is how do we how do we identify that or how do we replicate that within training? So for me, I'll take the rear foot elevated split squat or a Bulgarian single leg squat, however you term it. For me, if I'm in a single leg squat pattern and my rear foot is elevated, I'm looking at the angle of the front shin. Is it positive? Is it neutral? Is it negative? For me, if I'm in an accelerated base and I know that I'm going to dive into acceleration mechanics with this particular athlete, I'm going to be very obsessive about what angle they establish within there. Obviously, I'm taking out of the consideration. I'm assuming their ankle's good. They have adequate mobility. They have all these things that we've already addressed. But I'm going to look at that shin angle and say, all right, from an acceleration position, here's where we want to get you. And then not overstriding that. If we're at a neutral position, you're going to stress more of the backside mechanics. So for me, hamstring glute development, great. But with me, if I want to train the acceleration side with this particular athlete, I'm going to make sure that we're establishing the correct shin angle in that exact exercise. And then down the line, as it goes, once we establish on-field movement patterns, Rob, then we're getting into a lot of the details of, all right, wide receiver, here's what we want to teach based on our cut mechanics, here's the ideal angle because of our route tree, our route progressions based on our offense. Very, very different based on what our running backs might be taught because their patterning is completely unique to what a running back is going to have to do. Then you go to the opposite side of the ball, a defensive back or a linebacker establishing their movement norms is completely different from all those other guys. So we have to have that lens, Rob, to be able to look at positionally, what is the specific need of this athlete? So that's one of the first things. When we analyze what an athlete needs, even going back to beginning before we start, hey, we're going to an isometric phase. Before we consider any of that, we look at each athlete and we say, all right, What's their what's their injury history? Where's this athlete coming from? Are they post rehab? Are they post surgery? What's the ideal situation? 
What is their training age? Once again, is this a 10-year vet versus a third-year NFL player? There's a significant difference with most of those guys based on some of the regressions or modifications that we have to have. Then we go into positional demands. What are the positional demands based on this particular athlete who might play our offensive guard position? All right, that's unique. And then what are commonly injured areas within that position? We can train around those. We're trying to create a robust athlete that is efficient, but also can resist those injuries based on their exact position. So all those things go into it. And then the angles obviously are something that come down the line, Rob, where you have to look at from a performance standpoint, we're protecting them. They're resilient. We're trying to create a resilient athlete against injuries. But now from a performance, getting back to that engine model, how are we training them to perform at their optimal level at this exact position? That's where the details of the angles that we need to establish, the movement patterns, the efficiencies that they need around their position, those are hugely important at that point. So take us into the next phase. So we've got the early off season that you're working through now. What happens? What happens then? So for us, timeline, it's about April, early to mid-April. We transition to what's termed the NFL's off-season program. So for us, it's, it's our version of the university's spring football. We get the whole team back. This is a point where at, we haven't drafted our incoming rookies, so we're probably looking at about 70 athletes. And then we'll draft through the draft process and free agency. We'll bring in another 20, so we're at 90 as our maximum roster numbers. We start really with a regress form of our plyometric program. So once again, retraining. How do we receive load? I, I, before I even care about how an athlete, how much force can you exert? And once again, I'm going back to this is a power sport. Our goal, we have to be able to exert the optimal level of force from the ground into an opponent or into the ground so that I can redirect and cut and get around an opponent who's trying to stop me and impede me. So for me, we start with jumping and landing. How do you receive force? How do you receive your body weight? Now, how can we start to tweak some of these angles, but also some of the directions? How are we going from non-counter movement to counter movement? How are we progressing that? And then how are we going into a rapid response stage where now I'm starting to tie in some of the neuromuscular system. Now I'm starting to tie in some of the recovery. Now I'm starting to, to tie in really some of the reaction-based stuff that we can do off of that. So from our, our very simple plyometric program, we start, but then we we progress that, obviously, depending on the positions, depending on the size of the athlete, at a different level for each of those guys. Once we do that, we transition weight room-wise, strength building-wise. We're really into a dynamic phase where we're anticipating that the athletes over the previous six to eight weeks have done our isometric program, our eccentric-based program. So now we're at the point we're ready. We can load the muscular system. We can start to develop some really high tempo, some high-frequency movements. We can start to tie in some high-velocity-based stuff. So we're going to start to incorporate a lot of our platform-based work. We're going to do some power work. We're, I love gym aware. Whatever you utilize from a velocity-based training system standpoint, I think it's important that you're tracking because we can build them into specific speed bands where we know exactly what we're trying to accomplish with those athletes. So we're starting to transition into that where – a lot of what we do is movement-based, so we start there. What I want to identify, Rob, at this stage, correct any faulty movement mechanics. So any patterns that we identify, we do an intake assessment where we're screening all of our athletes, obviously, like everyone. We're trying to identify what do we need to correct now before we continue to progress the load because what I don't want is for anything to go uncorrected or unfixed at this point, and then we just start loading the athlete on top of that, and we're really, in, in effect, we're – adding on to their negative movement efficiencies. And what I don't want, I don't want to add and start to progress an athlete until we've fixed and corrected anything that we need to from movement inefficiencies and some of the things that could put them in a bad situation in a bad position for injury. So you mentioned before about Qualysys and, um, and Dari. Do you use any of them technologies to assess movement? We do. Dari is the primary one. The NFL is... That, is sorry, I was going to say, sorry, Ted, I was going to no. say, is that, a, is that an NFL thing? That is an NFL thing. It's not every team in the league now, but we've been part of a system. We had 16 teams that utilized the system last year. So that's something that we've used for our intake assessment. And it's something really unique where obviously I think we're on three or four years of data now. We can identify certain things. We've used Qualysis as well. For us, it's probably more of a highly specialized system where maybe our throwing athletes, our quarterbacks, our kickers, our punters, we've utilized some deceleration mechanic-based stuff within our Qualysis system. So we're using a lot of different systems. Part of that is based on the NFL, like I said, but also part of it is just based on, all right, how can we get the optimal movement pattern for an athlete just in deceleration phase? We're trying to tie everything into that. While we're on the topic, I know this wasn't on the list, but we said we'd go off topic anyway, so we're all good. So the, to the deceleration mechanics 
assessment using Qualysys. Talk us through that, if that's all right. So, yeah, really general. We're going to take our athletes, and once again, based on position, we'll either have positional requirements. In this one, we go a little bit more generalized. So when I look at a football team, an American football team, if I look at big guys, for us, our big athletes are guys that are a power dominant, our power dominant position. That's our offensive line and our defensive lineman. Traditionally, those guys are 300 plus pounds. I'll transition to a general mid skill position. So for us, these are our larger athletes, traditionally approaching sometimes 270, 280 pounds, tight ends, linebackers, running backs, some of the guys that still have to cover significant difference and play a lot of our special teams roles. So we need them to run fast. We need them to have great movement efficiency, but they're also big power type athletes playing inside the box and they're going to be they're going to be filled with contact through a game. And then our other guys, we call our skill positions, our wide receivers, our defensive backs, traditionally the smaller guys on our team, but are highly, highly elite guys from a speed and a movement perspective standpoint. I'll generalize them in those three categories. So bigs, mids and skills. Within that, we'll come up with ideal distances. Our big guys are 330 pounders. We obviously don't want them coming into an ultra aggressive deceleration phase where we're putting them into a cut position or something like that. And we're just putting them in an unnecessary injury risk. So for me, we shorten the stride, we shorten the distance from acceleration. So our buildup for those guys might be a five yard buildup. And then we try to go into a five yard deceleration where they have to decelerate within a five yard window. For our mid skills, we're going to allow them a little bit more speed as they build in. We might allow them seven to eight yards before we go into a high speed deceleration. For our skill guys, we might allocate them all the way from 10 to 12 yards, build into your speed, but then we we still want to isolate the deceleration form of this movement pattern so we have them hit the brakes as fast as possible. So from us, from a video standpoint, we're trying to look optimal angles, all right, optimal body position, where are your hips aligning, how are you setting into your shin angles, how are you aligning back, where's your thoracic spine, are you extending, are you in flexion, all those things are going to be part of the pattern that we go through from our subjective checklist to look at just from a visual cue, once again, being able to show an athlete a kinographic sequence and say, hey, here's where you were position-wise, here's the ideal frame, we want to show you where you're, where you're seated, where your hip position is versus where our optimal range is. Here's where we need to get you. And we start to teach through some of those fundamental mechanics. Perfect. So just going back to the, the plyos, the introduction of plyos, how are you modifying intensities of volumes for, like you said, the different size and d- different size of players that you're dealing with? Yeah, great question. Because from 380 pounds all the way down to 160 is what we deal with. So for us, Obviously, we can remove total contacts. So if I have a 380 pounder, I don't want them establishing a tremendous. I don't want them under 30 contacts in a plyometric progression in week one, day one. Our skill guys who are 180 pounds are probably better apt to handle that from that standpoint as long as they've went through just our general prep phase. So for me, looking at that, just total number of contacts and then obviously height of the hurdles. If we're using mini hurdles, if we're using anything from an external equipment standpoint, total distance total acceleration and deceleration into it, trying to look at all those things. So how aggressive are we into the height and then obviously into the deceleration of their body mass? All those things are traditionally the factors that we'll allocate for our bigs to our mids to our skills and it will isolate within those. Amazing. So so rather than go through the whole season, I think it'd be really interesting to get the the C in strength and conditioning and how that plays into this this period of time. So in this period of time that you're in now, up until you, you like you said, the, the, off, the traditional off season, are you working on the field or is it all gym based? Mostly gym based. We will do some lighter field work because once again, we stress the health of the tissue, the health of the joints, the health of the connective tissue at this point, Rob. And you look at it from a funded, if, if I flipped in and looked at a base of a pyramid, aerobic fitness, obviously not the primary thing that we're concerned with once we're in the middle of football season. This time of year, for a couple of reasons, number one, just pure aerobic fitness levels, but also establishing healthy and optimal playing weight so our guys aren't gaining additional calories and not gaining additional weight, and they're getting 10 pounds overweight by the time we start our off-season program. Those are factors we try to control. So we'll actually have our guys do low intensity cardiovascular work right now based on the aerobic zone. As we transition in, what we try to do is use joint friendly options where we're putting them on a Versa climber, we're putting them on a watt bike and a salt bike so that we can still stimulate some of the energy systems that we need to, but we're not going out in the field and we're pounding and grinding into the joints that they just spent the last six to seven months destroying. We're trying to get those back as we still maintain some of that aerobic and anaerobic fitness this time of year. Perfect. Just on that on that same theme, conditioning. 
there's been a couple of people that have been on the podcast where we've had this is the kind of core topic, but I'd really like to get your opinion and how your thoughts, you've been in the NFL for 16 years, like there's a lot that changes year to year, but over that period of time, what is, how have your thoughts on the conditioning side of things, the C and S and C developed and changed? Yeah, I love that question too. Our off season has changed. So if I look at this just as the last 10 years, we've went through multiple collective bargaining agreements where fast forward where we are now. But if I took away and looked at, I think 2011 is when this changed. We were in a pre-CBA where we had a 14 week off season period. Right now it's nine weeks. So we get our off season program shrunk by five weeks where two things happen. Obviously it's more important at that point that we try to establish optimal levels of anaerobic fitness so that they're ready to come back for training camp, which is the most important time of the season from injury reduction standpoint, just from primary physical football shape so that we can be ready to go in and actually take on a training camp for a month. So for us, we look at what that changes, where we used to have more time to step progress, once again, starting with the aerobic system and then tapping into the different anaerobic systems, Rob, where we have to be faster. We basically have to expedite that process now. So for us, this time of year is critically important, but nothing's mandatory. Nothing's mandatory this time of year. So we're depending on our players to make sure they're doing what they should be doing from just a general fitness establishment. Once they do that and we get them back, we really have to look at, all right, when does football start? My calendar counts back from that. How our, how our off-season programming works, we get two weeks. This is just general rules, and you can tweak them however you want. We get two weeks to prepare our athletes before they're on the field with sport coaches, with position coaches, going through full-speed football drills. Two weeks, you and I both know, Rob, is not long enough period to establish football conditioning levels where I feel adequately prepared to go out there and say, this athlete's injury resilient, we're good to go. Go ahead, hammer him full speed. So you look at how we progress that, how we progress time on field, how we progress drill selection and drill intensity and how we're undulating that factor. Those are huge considerations for us now where looking back 10 plus years ago, we didn't have to necessarily account for as much because we've lost that time, though it becomes this expedited process where we really got to be on our planning and we have to look at this time, our early off season, a little bit more critically to make sure that we're establishing great fitness before they come back for that official off season start. So when you said drill intensity and, and, and understanding that before they transition into with 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 um, technical staff, what how are you doing that? How are you monitoring that? Is it using GPS? Is it how how are you doing that? Yep, we use an RFID system. So for us, it's called Zebra Technology. It's what every NFL stadium has this in their stadiums. We use the same system at our practice facility. So for us, the on-field tracking is one of the most important factors that we can look at through our day-to-day -day data ingestion. As we do that, the thing that I've always tried to say is this, I need to marry my intensity, whether it's loading in the weight room, whether it's loading on field with a conditioning workout, we need to be able to marry those intensities with what they're going to be asked to do once we start full speed football. So once the technical coaches get a hold of them, we have to make sure that we're confident they're prepared fully to go take on those drills. So for us, it's sprinkling in drills that are very similar and we're building in the movement patterns that they're going to get stressed at when they do get back with their technical coaches. And then it's having a plan. It's having a periodized plan for how we're going to stack the intensity once we do get to that point, Rob, because it's still it's sharing time where there's still movement perspectives that I need to make sure that we're getting when they're going into their technical skills coaching. So we might have a first part of that on-field system, that first part of the on-field workout be 45 minutes of movement mechanics. Obviously, some of that, there's going, there's going to be an anaerobic component. There's going to be a fitness component to that. So making sure that I'm not doing too much where they're going into really a heightened injury concern rate when they get to the technical coaches. So marrying what we're doing and offsetting that with the intensity of the practice session for that day, being in constant communication with the coaching staff, making sure that we know what the intensity is going to be, making sure I know that I have to adjust my intensity off of that and vice versa. So really, it's a marriage. It's a concept where we have to be on the same page. We have to be in lockstep with the technical coaches to make sure what we're doing is not only not inhibiting what they can do, but it's building upon that and making sure that those those things are married. So from a concept standpoint, we're doing the things that are going to help them go perform in their technical aspects. There's a big thing over here in the UK and in Europe about the understanding from an s &C uh, performance coach perspective but understanding of the technical and the tactical to make sure that we're adequately preparing players for the demands of the game seems obvious but as you know 
physical performance coaches, staying in their physical performance world and not wanting to venture into the technical and tactical. Through your 16 years within the NFL, how was your need to be involved in the technical and tactical increased so you can do the physical stuff as as good as you can possibly do it? Yeah, this has been really cool, Rob, because what I've seen is, once again, I'll say the word marriage. Like there's been a concept where these two worlds have, have grown together out of necessity, right? Because as we look at from a performance standpoint, I have my natural inherent biases. From a technical standpoint, a position coach is going to have their technical biases. I'm not saying those are bad things because from our professional standpoint, our training, our career history, that's just what we've been exposed to. And that's what we've learned over the last 10 plus years, definitely. But certainly within the last handful, we have gotten so much more in crossbred. So for us, there's this crossover within everything that we do to where now the planning for on-field time, the planning for what our intensity of practice is going to be, the planning of drill selection for individual periods within each of the technical coaches across every position, that has actually become talking points for us and for me so that I can sit in these meetings and say, hey, from an intensity standpoint, we want today to be high intensity, guys. So wide receiver coaches, I need you to hit high speed yardage. I want high level intensity in our decelerations and our cutting and our accelerations. Here are the numbers we're trying to get and showing them objective data from our from whether it's zebra or catapult or whatever you're using and saying, here's where we need to get today. And then coming back to it and making sure you're holding yourself accountable. Everyone else takes ownership and says, Hey, did we hit our numbers or not? It's not always, I think sports science gets a bad rap because people think it's always saying we got to do less. We got to do less. I'm trying to do as much as humanly possible and get them right to that point so that we can have a super compensation effect, bring them down, let them adequately recover and then go do it again. So for me, it's leveraging that and weaponizing the data so that the coaches see, oh, man, they want me to get, yeah, get after your guys. We need to do this. So that marriage has come, and I think it's built a stronger relationship within performance and the technical coaches within our sport, at least, because I feel like I'm closer to our position coaches now because we do have those organic back and forth conversations about what drill should I do on this day what versus what drill should I do on this lower intensity day. And it's open, really good lines of communication, Rob. It was interesting because I was just watching the, um, an interview with a, an ex-player, a, so- a soccer player, and this, he so he was involved in, in this with the introduction of sports science, the introduction of GPS, and I, I think he'd mentioned, I've heard it loads of this kind of age of athlete, when sports science was exactly seen as what you've just described, when you've hit a certain number, you're done, like when you've hit a certain yardage or meterage, you, you, you're out, and that was going against his instinct because he was a, a worker and he wanted to do more, always wanted to do more. So I think it's really important, especially when you watch the TV and people get influenced by what that that initial maybe introduction of sports science and how that's still clouding what goes on today of the perception. We always want they, they, them guys over there, the laptop and, you know, they always want us to do less when that that's that's changing. But I think it's still, people are still hurt from that initial maybe introduction of sports science. Is that the same over there? 100%. Same thing. And it, I feel horrible because it's probably impacted a lot of people from having positions that could be long-term established because obviously I believe there's there's a huge benefit in sports science. But having the awareness, I think, is what separates a lot of people being able to describe. I guess the good the good part of me, Rob, I'm a meathead by heart. Like I want, I'm that guy that wants to go harder and do more. What I've learned through my knowledge and just through work experience is – knowing when to do that because there's still a time and a place for that but knowing when to go on the opposite end and say all right we do have to back down because that allows me to lay out the plan a little bit better so that i'm getting ahead of those questions right as a leader as a person who's running a program you have to be able to answer the questions what's the why my goal is to never have a coach ask me later on why do we do this if i'm doing a great job with my communication i'm doing a great job of laying out the master plan then I've already hopefully answered most of those questions, the bulk of them by, hey, guys, here's the layout for the next month of training camp. Here are the days where we really need to attack them from an intensity standpoint. Here are the days from a duration standpoint. We're going to be on the field for a long time. We have to build up this endurance so that we know that we can go into an overtime contest and still dominate. 
versus, hey, guys, here are the down days. These are the days where we're going to do recovery work down here. We're going to make sure that we're, we're flipping over tissue. We're regenerating. And this is going to allow us to attack these back-to-back -back high days that you guys are going to get on the opposite end. So laying out that plan, I think there's an art to that. There's an art in communication. We got to make sure that we're doing a great job of laying out that plan while still maintaining the ability to adapt. Just like everything, I, you know, we always know you have to be able to adapt in this field, Rob, because if you don't, you could have the best plan ever. It's never going to work out in the ideal scenario that you have planned in your head. So making sure you can step back, detach from it, and still adapt is also very important. Amazing. Right, we're going to get into another topic here around player safety. I know you've mentioned it a couple of times, and it kind of it plays into all what you've just spoken about. But tackle prep, contact prep, big thing for you guys, as it is over here in, in rugby and, and similar um, collision sports. How are you... How do you frame that? How do you view that? How are you preparing your athletes for that? Yeah, once again, it starts body armor. We have to make sure we're not neglecting just training our athletes for performance. We have to develop body armor because it is a big physical sport. Obviously, we wear external paddings versus some of the guys in rugby who don't. There's, It's crazy just the level of contact in both of those sports. We actually try to cross over and learn from whoever we can. Richie Gray is a guy that's taught rugby tackling skills for a long time. I've known Richie almost 10 years. Richie's a guy we brought in to consult on certain things, and he's developed some great equipment that we utilize. So working in concert with, all right, who else can we learn from? Well, shoot, let's look at rugby. They're doing the same thing from a high-frequency force standpoint that we do without padding. How the heck are they keeping their head out of this? How are they protecting muscular systems? How are they not inhibiting? How are they not getting more shoulder injuries and some of these things? Looking at that and trying to pull from it what we can learn and then tacking into those things technically when we put them in. So tackling drills and then obviously repeating them. How are we actually teaching these skills on top of us from a foundational standpoint, hopefully building that body armor up so that they're able to withstand the contact when it does come. So at what point in the year in relation to what's happening now, are, are guys going full contact? We're not allowed to go full contact until our our season starts. So, Rob, for us, that's July. Once training camp starts, we're not even allowed to wear padding. We can't wear any of our equipment until that point. So, for us, it allows, I guess, more of time so we can slow down. It allows us to sit at a point and say, all right, what are the technical skills that maybe we struggled with last year? All right, it was getting out of position. I'm just throwing random examples all right, let's train that through the off season. Without padding, we can use some of the equipment that's available because that's the beauty of where we are now in our world. We have great equipment. We have great things. Technology has, has caught up to us and surpassed us in a lot of ways. So we can train those skills now without putting on the pads, without putting us into a situation where we have to take on contact that at this time of year is probably going to be detrimental from our guys that are still recovering from the season. So can you utilize things like grappling? We can. Yep. Okay. So you can grapple. We can do some of those things. When we get into actual football practice, there's a long list of rules, as you can imagine, based on our collective bargaining agreement with the NFLPA. There's some things we're not allowed to do. We can't do certain competitive drills, say, for instance, between our offensive line and our defensive line. So there are there are big there's limitations. But within that, there's ways that we can still train those skills. And that's what's important. You're only limited by your creativity. And once again, leveraging some of the equipment that we have available and some of the things that can teach ideal leverage and ideal contact points. And really for us, a lot of it is Rob pursuit angles, which brings us back to movement, movement efficiencies and movement mechanics. If I'm pursuing a ball carrier, what's my optimal angle so that I can put myself in a leverage standpoint where I can leverage my inside versus outside shoulder or whatever the situation calls for at that point, teaching and training those patterns now so that when we do finally put on the pads, we don't skip a beat. We've done it. We've trained in that environment. They've seen it. They've felt it. They've learned it visually, and they've actually practiced it at full speed. So is tackle technique the biggest thing that you look to rugby as an influence? For? Yeah. yeah. Yep. It's def In the last few years, a lot of people are doing that. So I think that's probably for the last decade, definitely five, six, seven years. That has had definitely a cross influence within the NFL. Interesting. Right. A few last questions for you before I, before I let you go on, on the hour. And I think these are really, these are really interesting ones. And as I was writing this, th these are some that I've sprinkled in every now and again in with with podcast guests. And I, I want to keep these in all the time because I think the I think they're fascinating. So the most impactful thing you've added to a program, I've put last twelve months, but it could be twenty four months, thirty six months. What's the most impactful thing you've added to the program? Yeah, I was going to say the last twelve months. If I went outside of twelve months, I would ten eighty. Our 1080 sprint has been awesome. I, the amount of data that we can pull from that, it, to me, I almost look at the 1080 
like we looked at the force plate when we started utilizing the force plate years ago. I think that's had a dramatic impact, not only from a training perspective, but from a data perspective, getting baseline testing, being able to look at our acceleration abilities between athletes, even all the way down to the line, Rob, where we can look at that as another layer of identifying optimal playing weights for our guys. Where do they lose efficiency versus where do they gain power distribution force? All those things have been really cool for us to look at. So if I had to answer one, I think that would be one of the biggest ones. And just going back to the deceleration topic, do you use it from a deceleration perspective as well? Okay. We do, absolutely. Nice. Yep. nice. Any particular way you use it from a deceleration perspective? We'll do change of direction stuff like 505. We'll do a lot of testing and then we'll do just straight towing into a deceleration stop. So once again, efficiency, and we'll overlay this with camera views, efficiency of the angles where the athlete's establishing, how much force are they able to put in the ground? And then obviously when we're looking at the 1080 stuff, being able to isolate, asymmetries is huge so if it's a return to it's a return play player that gives us tremendous value because if we have baseline testing and we have an acl rehab we can start to look at where that athlete needs to get to that's been hugely valuable from a, from a forgetting the return to play return to performance stuff when it comes to asymmetries and the, and the 1080 do you look at it from a performance perspective if someone's fit using the 1080 how much how much influence do you put on decision making through that asymmetry data? Do you use it specifically? Does it trigger anything? It well, it helps us ask the next layer of questions. I'm always trying to get more context. So if if something pops at 15% and I see a significant asymmetry, it adds another layer of context because I'm walking up to that player and saying, Hey, do you have anything going on? Yeah, I got a little tightness in my left calf. All right, perfect. That helped me get to the point really fast. Or it could be a point where they're like, no, I feel fine. All right, interesting. You flag for an 18% asymmetry here. Let me go take another layer. Now I'm going to their force plate data. Now I'm going into their incoming intake assessment that we did with Dari. I'm going down those additional layers, and it's helping me ask follow-up questions, Rob. So hopefully I'm identifying at some point. The unique thing is there are certain positions within our sport where we develop an asymmetry, and it's, it's out of necessity. If I'm a left tackle and I've played a specific position where I'm literally loading my right side from a quad perspective and I have to kick step every time we pass the football, I am creating an asymmetry over years and years and years of repetitive use versus the guy that plays technically the same position, but he's on the right side and you flip flop his anatomy. He's left side pusher. He's a right side kick step. I have to look at those athletes and take that into context too, because I guarantee both of them are probably going to demonstrate at least a low level asymmetry. If I overcorrect that, I'm going to start to go into some patterning where I'm probably being detrimental to the athlete based on what actual position skills they have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Perfect. So this is possibly my favorite question out of these two. Okay. So what have you changed your mind on over the last 12 months? That could be through reading research. That could be through experience. That could be through talking to a player, talking to a colleague. It's interesting. I So I'll give you my my first instinct, my first answer that popped into my head, it's people. And this goes across, but from a, being in a leadership position and doing this for a few years now, where you have to make sure that you're dealing with people, that 90% of the things that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis now, Rob, are not, what are we programming for the next phase? How are we going to alter this and modify? It? It's, hey, this person's going through that. We need to talk to this person. It's people issues. So for me, understanding from an empathy standpoint, trying to do the right things, trying to be a good human being, living by the rule, just don't be a bad person and making sure you're approaching everyone and trying to help people when you can. Ultimately, the most important thing that I've come across in my life so far, I think once you do those things, you set yourself up for success and you draw other good people towards you. I'll give you more of a technical answer. I think where I am right now, once again, going back to movement efficiencies and a lot of it is from listening to podcasts like this and just reading and diving into some research-based stuff, but also hearing people that I have higher level of respect for talk, the amount of time that we spent on acceleration, building up speed, creating better speed patterns over the last decade, maybe maybe further back, I think it's slowly transitioned. Like I've, I'm putting all my eggs in the basket of deceleration, and I have probably for the last, it's been more than a month or a, a year. But looking at the importance of not just deceleration, but multiple directions and multiple environments where our players have to decelerate within a contact sport, within a lot of moving variables, 
I look at the game completely different now. I look at the game and I'm watching for angles and I'm watching for setup patterns. I'm watching for loading. Then I'm watching for the ability to stop and redirect force. I think from that standpoint, Rob, from a technical standpoint, I, I see the game very differently now. And I have a huge appreciation for how much that impacts not just health, but performance of every one of our players, regardless of what position they play. I think that's one of the biggest things that's going to continue to become more studied and more researched. I think that's going to continue to blow up over time. And I think that's something I'm assuming you would agree with, but I, I've just seen a, a ton of value in looking at deceleration, finding better ways to assess it and analyze it, and then finding better ways to train better efficiency of that exact movement. I think the interest in that topic is is booming um, and it's only going to increase. And as you joined on the on the uh, round table, Damien Harper done, done a great job in this particular area and, and still do more work. Well, what triggered that? What triggered the interest in deceleration? Was it just a realization of you know, watching, watching films and, and, and understanding a little bit more about the game and just going, yeah, this is just more important. Research comes out, backs that up and it kind of builds. Probably the same thing going into the next level of context, because when this started, when I first got into my career, when do injuries happen? Most injuries happen during some form of deceleration. Even if you're looking at a throwing athlete, upper body mechanics is when they're decelerating their arm, looking at that from a holistic standpoint, just in athletics, every sport. And then as I've gotten, in, I've gotten into asking deeper questions, studying people like Damien, seeing, all right, where does this actually end? It doesn't end anywhere. Like everything is dependent upon deceleration at some point, even if I'm just trying to stop and redirect my force so that I can go into a cut angle and avoid a defender trying to tackle me. So everything is built upon those layers of now it's not just, yeah, okay, if you don't decelerate or if you put yourself in a really bad shin angle and your knees over top, this could happen. It's not from an injury mechanic standpoint. It's more from performance. And it's, well, how do we get the optimal angle so that they can not just decelerate, but be in an optimal angle so that they can reaccelerate their body weight or into their opponents so that they can go through them? I think that's where it's it's added more context, just asking more questions throughout the years. Great answer. Great answer. Well, I know you've got to um, shoot in seven minutes. So I'm going to give you a little bit of leeway. Maybe you can grab a coffee before you go into your next meeting. Love but it. Ted, thank, thank you very much for joining me. It's been a pleasure to um, to get you on the podcast officially and uh, look forward to keeping in touch. If anyone wants to get in touch with you or follow you on socials, where's the best place? Yeah, I got uh, at Ted Rath uh, on Twitter, X, Ted Rath's train coach on Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. So I'm on all that uh, LinkedIn, all that good stuff. Perfect. Cheers, Ted. Look forward to Thanks, you. I appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for the time.